Uh, welcome to Dawn or Doom 2018. We're on the Monday afternoon session, and uh, I'm about to introduce Naomi Graywall to come and speak to us about the age of personalization, how technology enables more custom experiences. So with information flying by us at what has to be described as light speed, attention is now the most valuable of commodities for both the messenger and the intended recipients of the message. What we as information consumers increasingly demand in return for our attention is personalization, superior content, relevant and tailored specifically for us. Among digital platforms today, personalization, understanding users' intent, is becoming essential both to ensure that the right content is offered to the right user and to ensure that advertisers reach the right customers at the right moment. Naomi Graywall is the perfect speaker to address the topic of personalization, its impact on consumer engagement and its practical application. Graywall leads the insights operation at Pinterest. Her team focuses on helping advertisers leverage Pinterest by using data to understand users across audiences, markets, events, and search behavior. Prior to Pinterest, she led North American consumer insights at Facebook. She has a background in market research leadership roles, including stints at SurveyMonkey, UI, now user Zoom, and Ipsos. She earned a doctorate in cognitive psychology from Claremont Graduate University and was recognized with the Neuro Talent of the Year Award from the Neuro Marketing Science and Business Association. She also holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from Columbia University. She lives in the San Francisco area with her husband and daughter. She is currently pinning ideas about megaforma Pilates workouts, a phrase I never thought I would use, family-friendly travel destinations, and baby-proofing a house. Today, she will present a talk entitled The Age of Personalization, How Technology Enables More Custom Experiences. Naomi is probably, we have an hour here, she's probably gonna talk for about 30 or 35 minutes, and then she'll be delighted to take questions at the end of that session at one of the two mics here, if you would just come and form a, a line at the mic. So because we're recording the event, that's important, that would help us, all right? So please take a moment right now to silence all electronic devices, but feel free to tweet using hashtag dawn or doom. Artists from the Ink Factory will be creating visual recaps of the talks from our presenters, and you're welcome to take pictures after and share them on social media. And don't be afraid to chat with the artist and ask questions when they're finished drawing. Thank you, and enjoy Naomi Graywall. All right, can everyone hear me? Perfect. So I am delighted to be here today, of course, to represent Pinterest and to talk to you about personalization. Um, but maybe I'll start just with a little personal bit about me. I actually was born here in West Lafayette. <laughs> yes. This is my first time returning. I left when I was 11 months old and <laughs> My parents were professors at Purdue in the economics department. Um, and me and my twin sister were born here. Um, we even participated in some psychological testing on twins my mom told me about. So I uh, went on a run this morning and saw the house that, that I came home to initially. So it's really, really special for me to be here. Um, but today I'm here to talk about personalization and First, when we think about personalization, the reason I picked this topic is because I think it has a, a sort of positive side and a negative side, and I felt like it fit in quite nicely with the concept behind this whole conference in terms of dawn or doom. And just to tell you what I'm going to be saying, I'm going to talk mostly from, from the positive side <laughs> in terms of personalization, but I would love to take questions and sort of open up a discussion on, you know, Personalization could be seen as creepy or harmful, 
and even if I back up when I talk about personalization, I'm going to be talking about advertising specifically. So we, as users of different services and apps, provide some information about ourselves and in exchange get some superior customer experience, some you know, seamless interaction online, or get recommended things that we know we will enjoy. And so that involves a trade-off. It could be seen as, as kind of creepy to provide this information about yourselves and, and for that to be used in advertising. But on the flip side, we get some value out of that exchange as well. All right, so um, I lead the insights practice for the advertising business at Pinterest. So Pinterest, you, know, you may think of Pinterest as sort of a visual search engine or possibly related to social media. You go on Pinterest and you pin different ideas to different boards and you kind of curate ideas and uh, organize them. Um, but there are sort of two sides to a lot of these technology companies. There's people that work on the core part of the business in sort of product and engineering, so creating the service that you may know as Pinterest. And then there's the other part of the business that kind of generates the revenue, the monetization arm of Pinterest. And I lead a, an insights and research team focused on that monetization part of Pinterest. So the team does two things. First, they build insights tools which are really just dashboards. So we take a look at all the data that users you know, provide for us, all the observations of user behavior on Pinterest about what people are saving and searching for. And my team creates dashboards that enable our, our sales teams, our advertising sales teams, to use that data to help them uh, in their conversations with potential advertisers. So as an advertising business, we're trying to get brands to advertise on Pinterest. That's how we, how we make money. The second part of my team does more sort of thought leadership or consumer research. So this involves not only Pinterest internal data on what we're observing in terms of people's on-platform behavior, but also looking externally and asking some questions around you know, via a survey or a focus group or ethnography, you know, using a, a combination of qualitative and quantitative methods to understand pinners' behavior and their motivations behind some of that behavior. And all of that, again, goes to our sales teams, which eventually goes to our prospective advertisers. Now, my background, as was mentioned, is in academia. Um, I've worked on all sides of the market research industry. And by that, I mean um, for a vendor like Ipsos is a global market research company. There, I actually was incorporating new innovative methodologies into traditional market research. So things like facial coding or implicit reaction time testing or eye tracking, so sort of psychological methods into traditional research. I've worked at, on the supplier side at a company like SurveyMonkey that supplies a survey platform to a vendor. And I've more recently worked on the vendor side of market research, or sorry, the, the client side of market research at Facebook, leading North America Consumer Insights, and now at Pinterest. Um, so within my organization, we report into a team called Measurement Science and Insights. And the goal of that overall team is to use data, research, and scientific methods to help our advertising partners inspire pinners to discover and do what they love. And we do that in two different ways. First, my team really focuses on going wide at an industry and a vertical level to understand how and why pinners are using the platform. So by the vertical level, I mean our sales teams are actually divided into different verticals. And so we have sellers that are focused on consumer packaged goods. We have sellers that are focused on retail. And all of those require some research to understand what are pinners doing in that particular vertical and why should advertisers be on Pinterest for those brands. Other pieces of the measurement science and insights team focus more on digging deep at an individual advertiser level to understand how best these partners can measure the effectiveness of ads on Pinterest. But what I want to talk to you today about is 
attention and the attention economy. And so when we think about the digital advertising space and all these players, there are probably many, many more that I don't have up here, um, really our you know, eyeballs, eyeballs or views, uh, have become a currency in this world. So all of these companies are asking users to you know, supply some information when they sign up for a service. And in exchange, that person is you know, getting that service, but of course, um, you know, getting targeted with ads that are related to the things that they're searching and, and saving for. And so what, what I'm going to talk about today is really that, um, yes, our attention has become a, a, a commodity, and, and truly um, the companies that are going to succeed in this environment are those that are really putting the user first, are really listening to their own consumers, and are providing more value than they're extracting from their own users. So there are a couple examples of companies doing this really well. Um, and then, of course, I'll go on to make the case for why, why Pinterest is as well. <laughs> but, um, but Netflix, who here uses Netflix? Everyone, yeah. So, <laughs> so Netflix, you sign up for an account. Uh, you provide some basic demographic information about yourself. And once you start um, rating different shows or movies, or you start watching different shows or movies, Netflix is learning about your preferences. Netflix has a recommendation algorithm that takes all of that as inputs and then will you know, supply top picks for you. And as a user, for me, that's really valuable because I used to spend like hours arguing with my husband over what movie to watch, and by the time that hour passes, you're just fed up and you don't even want to watch a movie. But now, we're very likely to find something that we would like because Netflix has learned about our preferences, and they're recommending things that are um, I'm very likely to like. Spotify is another good example of this. So similar type of thing. This is a, a playlist called Discover Weekly, that is curated based on music that you already love. So what you are listening to and what you are loving on Spotify is informing what shows up in your Discover Weekly. So this makes my experience as a user superior because it's a bit of a, a seamless experience. I am saving time and energy in my own resources and getting exactly what I enjoy. And what I'd like to argue is that Pinterest is, is along those lines. Um, Pinterest is a visual discovery engine that helps you find and do what you love. And within that, our core um, sort of tenet is putting our pinners first. So we're extremely, you know, completely transparent in terms of what data we have on our users and how we're using that data. We understand the value exchange that consumers are um, undergoing, and we believe that we're providing more value than we're uh, extracting. And in turn, we believe through our platform, people are enabling, or we're enabling people to really enrich their lives. So it's not just about um, users coming to our platform and finding ideas and sharing those ideas, but it's really about them taking those ideas into the real world, taking them offline. And so we think we're a positive platform where we're enabling people to do those things. So this is a screenshot of my own Pinterest feed from a couple weeks ago. Um, so this is my home feed. You can scroll through and, and you can you know, look at a variety of different pins that you may be interested in. What do you guys think this tells you about maybe my life stage? Any ideas? <laughs> Maybe that I like cheesecake. <laughs> Someone at your house eats baby food. Someone at my house eats baby food, yes. So yes, so from just a quick screenshot, we can, and of course we have you know, far more than screenshots of people's data, but we can really infer someone's life stage based on what they're saving and searching for. That's what's showing up in my home feed. And as a result, yes, I have a 16-month-old daughter. You could probably gather that from looking at some of my data. And of course, again, I think that has positive and, and negative effects. 
Pinterest may know that I have a 16-month-old daughter. On the flip side, I'm getting the most relevant curated content for me that I'm asking for and that I want. So pinners really demonstrate their consumer intent through their boards. Um, so for example, someone planning a Christmas party, elevating their food skills, developing a grocery list. These boards aren't just for pie in the sky ideas. We're not purely an inspiration platform. These are boards that are demonstrating a high level of intent to actually carry through on something. So when someone's coming to Pinterest and and searching and then naming a board something. So for example, I have a baby board, which I save a lot of baby related things to that. Think about the vast quantity of data where we would know, you know, one pin related to, um, I don't know, uh, cribs falls into my baby board and that pin also falls into someone else's baby shower board. And knowing the interrelationships between these board names and these um, pins really enables us to find sort of a taxonomy of different ideas across all of these pins and boards. And pinners offer really strong signals of intent through naming boards and through just searches. So we can actually follow people across sort of the whole customer journey. So this is an example where we took a look at pinners that started looking for remodeling ideas in January of 2018. And we sort of you know, uh, created an audience of those people based on their search behavior. Then we looked one year before that uh, searching and saving behavior. And what we can see is you know, one year before, they're very likely welcoming a new member of their family. They're searching for things like nursery ideas and baby clothes. Those, they're over-indexing on those searches relative to the general population. Within a year of that remodel, they're really focusing in on that remodel. Right? They're looking for inspiration, active consideration, things like budget tips, first home, farmhouse decor. Four to six months after that initial searching on remodeling, they're looking for finishing touches. Things like mailbox makeovers, stainless steel farmhouse sink, entryway benches, all of those are kind of trending later on. So really strong signals of intent that we can understand with our data. All of this is powered by what's called Pinterest taste graph, which is basically that, that um, taxonomy of ideas, and it's, it's what we refer to as our personalization recommendation algorithm. It helps pinners explore their personal tastes by connecting them to the most relevant content and branded content, so both ads and organic content. And we're really just taking raw data here and sort of modeling uh, according to people's tastes as they evolve over time. Now, personalization means we really get pinners. We get to know them better as they use the platform, and we collect content in unique ways. Each month, pinners will have over 50 interests that are targetable by advertisers, and over 12 new interests compared to the prior month. So these are not static individuals that we're learning about. These are people that are constantly evolving. One month, they're in the market for a lamp. The next month, something completely different. And imagine how useful that is for advertisers to know. They know how to reach a person who's in the market for something that they may be selling at the right time. People come to Pinterest for a variety of use cases. So in a given month, most pinners will have interests that span more than seven high-level categories that are sort of covered within our taxonomy. So things like food and drink, home and garden, parenting, and fashion. So pinners really love Pinterest. When they come to Pinterest, they might come for parenting, but they kind of go down the Pinterest rabbit hole and eventually you know, create boards across all these big categories. The Pinterest taste graph connects over 250 million people worldwide with over 175 billion ideas or pins by modeling Pinterest tastes and interests and constantly evolving with those. 
So I want to talk a little bit about some research that my team has done on personalization, um, really focused on trying to understand whether personalization is uh, a competitive advantage for Pinterest. So you know, we understand we have these recommendation algorithms. We had such sort of a hypothesis that people feel we're a highly personalized platform, but we wanted to get some research and, and some data to back that up. So this is a quanti most of this is results from a quantitative survey um, of pinners. We also look at a competitive read of users of various other platforms that are our competitors. So what we're seeing from this is just in terms of Pinterest uh, ratings themselves, 82% of pinners find Pinterest content highly personalized. Um, again, huge numbers here across the board in terms of relevancy and uh, the content evolving with our users. And all of this is, is sort of uh, the competitor average down below. If you're curious who else is in that competitive average, um, this gives you a view of that. So we looked at Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, Google, YouTube, and Instagram. And pinners rate Pinterest as a more personal space that feels really custom tailored to them. All these other um, platforms, again, we've asked sort of uh, weekly users of each platform. And pinners discover new products or brands on Pinterest more so than they do on other platforms as well. So it's not just that they're finding our platform highly tailored to them and highly personal, but it's that they're taking it sort of one step further in saying, yes, I um, therefore, because it's personalized, I'm able to find what I want more readily. And this just gives you a view across all the brand perceptions we looked at um, and relative to our competition. So we're actually most similar to Google. Um, a lot of people associate Pinterest with social media and would compare us to Instagram or Facebook. Um, but if you take a look at a lot of the data, we're actually much more similar to a search engine, and that's sort of why we call ourselves a visual search engine. But we perform really strongly in, uh, across the board here. Helps my taste evolves, gives me recommendations a close friend would have, and influences what I decide to buy. So across this research, um, you know, we find that people really love Pinterest because it's a place where they can explore their own personal tastes. Beyond that, we also asked about people's openness to advertising on Pinterest, and we asked this for weekly users of all the other competitive platforms. And so not only do people find that Pinterest you know, is highly personal, but as a result, people are saying they are very open to advertising. They are in a mindset where they are already shopping, they're already looking for something, they're actively considering what to do or buy next, and as a result, uh, they're very you know, uh, willing to uh, see relevant ads to them at that time. And relevancy really drives performance here. So pinners are 30% more likely to engage with an ad on Pinterest that they find relevant. So it's really about getting that right ad at, at the right time. Speaking of relevancy, um, this just came out about six weeks ago. Uh, profit brand relevance index, they um, do a survey of US consumers every year and look at you know, the most um, relevant US consumer brands globally. Or actually, sorry, this is in the US. Um, and within the US last year, we were number five. Um, this year, we're, we're number three, and we come ahead of any of the other social media platforms. So it's this personalization. It's really this perception of personalization among our consumers that's causing people to say, yes, this, uh, this brand is highly relevant to me. It's serving me content that I, that I really want. And we find that pinners come to Pinterest in a shopping mindset more so than they do other sites. Now note, Amazon is not up here. I'm sure there would be um, you know, a, a, a difference there in terms of people are obviously coming to something like Amazon looking for shopping. And they say that advertising on Pinterest impacts their purchase decisions more so than other platforms. Now we, we asked people within the survey what the value of a pin was. And the way we asked this was what, um, 
you know, percentage of people saying they would take some action based on saving a pin. Um, so 92% of people said they would actually go out and act on a pin that they've saved. Uh, we also asked this for our competitors in terms of liking on Facebook. Only 71% said they would take action based on liking something on Facebook. So again, very action-oriented pinners here. And not only are they action-oriented, but we actually know they're, they're highly engaged shoppers. So they're actually purchasing more, they spend more, and they care more about quality. So after we've completed that personalization research, there were still a few open questions as to kind of what's, what's driving this perception of personalization. It's great that people see us as a highly personalized platform. Um, obviously, this is you know, a great story for Pinterest to tell in terms of a, a competitive advantage and a differentiator compared to some of those social media competitors. But what is driving these perceptions? And so we did some brand new research. This has just come out this past week um, on people's emotions, attitudes, and usage of Pinterest to try to tease this out a little bit. Um, there were two pieces of this research, and I'm just going to show a quick summary of it. But we did some uh, qualitative sort of digital ethnographies where we followed pinners for several weeks and, and sort of asked them a bunch of questions about how they were using Pinterest and how they were feeling while they were using Pinterest. We also did some quantitative survey research as well. And what we're finding is that people actually come to Pinterest with a very different mindset compared to competitors. So when you come to Facebook or Instagram, you're thinking about the past, like something has already happened, and you're sharing a photo of that experience. So in this case, I have already redone my living room. When you're on Snapchat or Twitter, you're talking about the present. You're talking about, you know, I'm redoing my living room, or I'm at a talk hearing someone speak. <laughs> I'm sure many of you are on Twitter. <laughs> What's different about Pinterest is it's a forward-looking, it's a future-looking platform. Someone is actually planning on redoing their living room. And this makes it so exciting for brands because they want to help influence those decisions, right? And so we're very, very early in the funnel. So someone is planning to do something, they're coming to Pinterest to get inspired, to discover new ideas, and then they want to go act on it. And advertisers, brands can reach people when they're when pinners are in that planning mindset. Just some, some quotes that came out of this. So my mindset is more productive. It's very purpose-driven, less about leisure time, more about active participation. Or I'll look on Facebook or Instagram just because I'm bored. I don't really do that with Pinterest. It's about needing an idea for an upcoming party or a new chair that I want to buy or a haircut that I want to get. I will purposefully get on Pinterest. So I think a large part of this is just that, that mindset that users come to Pinterest with. Now, of course, when we think about these other social media competitors, a lot of them have, you know, sort of measure their success in some part based on the time spent on the platform. It's a metric you may have heard about in the news. And, uh, time spent is something that um, a lot of these companies have focused on in the past. At Pinterest, we're actually really interested in the concept of time well spent. So we know we're a platform where people may not visit um, every day. That's not really the game we want to win at. Um, we're much more interested in fulfilling time spent. So if we can make the case for time spent on Pinterest being more valuable, um, that could make us a, a better option for an advertiser when they're thinking about where to spend their, their media dollars. So this is sort of the new research, the new emotion, attitude, and usage research. This is looking across uh, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube, and Amazon. You see Amazon is performing just as well as we are on this uh, metric, but you know, we have a 100-page deck, and this is just, just one slide that I wanted to share. Um, but I, I do think this is an important point, that time spent on Pinterest is often seen as, as more fulfilling, especially compared to social media sites. And so across this new piece of research, to kind of summarize what we're seeing, 
Pinterest really supports an emotional experience that's more mindful and more relaxed compared to social competitors. It provides a space to really decompress and spend more quality time focused on oneself rather than sharing photos about you know, yourself with others. It fosters a, a positive environment. So instead of um, sort of creating an environment of social comparison, we're, much, we're not really about sharing anything. We're, we're much more about creating a positive environment for yourself. And it leaves pinners feeling more empowered and energized. So I'll just close with, you know, when we're thinking about um, the attention economy, I think the, the platforms that eventually will succeed in this are those that are focused on the user experience, um, focused on, on putting their users first, and really delivering more value than, than they're taking from, from those users. Um, but with that, I would love to take some questions and even really open to discussing sort of the the doom side of personalization as well. Um, so yeah, I will stop there. So I'm gonna go to the doom side. <laughs> A lot of um, social media companies are collecting data and in the news today that's how do we uh, turn the data into uh, that's not good for social good. Can you talk about what Pinterest is doing with the data you're collecting that goes beyond making money for Pinterest, maybe for a social good or a social cause with uh, groups of people or regions or countries? Yeah, I, I'll just give one uh, quick example. We're doing something called uh, Campaign for Good, which is something actually my team started, which is um, using our own, as a Pinterest employee, we get some what's called dog fooding credits. So we get a certain amount of money each week to spend on advertising, and we're um, working with a company, a, a charity called Donors Choose, which um, enables uh, sort of teachers to um, uh, build curriculum and uh, leverage. Uh, uh, basically, we're we're promoting this charity that then enables education effectively. So we're working across the entire business organization to get people together to. Um, not only learn sort of our own advertising products like Ads Manager, but also use that those dog fooding credits for good and working with donors, donors choose in that case. So just one example. But there, I mean, outside of advertising, of course, Pinterest helps people do and discover what they want. So there are lots of examples beyond that as well. Uh, maybe on this side, yeah. Hello. Um, so you talked a lot about in your research about like all the positive you saw, stuff you found from your research about Pinterest, but could you talk about what you're currently doing based on that research or plan to do um, to make Pinterest even better and go beyond um, and maybe some of the insights you found from that research? Yeah, so my team is not focused on, so I, I sort of started by talking about the core part of the business and the, uh, the monetization side of the business. There's actually a separate team focused on the core. Um, so that's not exactly in my wheelhouse. Um, but that being said, all of our work, I mean, for example, this emotion, attitude, and usage work, all of that is helping us understand, like, why is Pinterest valuable to people? And that, in turn, enables us to um, take those recommendations that we find through that to our engineers, make changes to our platform, one of the recent things uh, that we've been exploring is like a, a follow tab, for example. So, you know, should we play in the social media space? Should we allow people to share content? Is that something that's valuable to users? Um, some of the questions from our research are looking into that, and we, of course, make those recommendations to a variety of people internally as a result. So one of the positive things about actually going to a store or a library is the happy accident, you know, where you find something that you didn't think you would like, um, didn't know about. So how, in general, both at Pinterest, where you have your motivated um, people, um, more generally, how do you keep people from getting into a taste bubble mm. through the recommendation algorithms? And, mm. and 
Okay. How do you provide for that happy accident in the oh, Great question. So um, when you click on a pin, you can actually see related pins. So I, I think currently what happens is that sort of Pinterest rabbit hole. So you may be searching for something in particular, find something, and then to sort of double click into it and see related items. Um, it really would require either a new sort of search query or some piece of, let's say, branded content and ad being served to you based on your demographics, let's say, for you to discover something entirely new. But it is primarily user-led. It's usually a search query where someone says, today I want to search for shoes, and that in turn brings them to the retail area and they'll find some, some interesting clothing item as a result of that. So you don't ever sort of throw in a random or a distance from their choice that kind of? You know, I can't say confidently that we do, I'm, but I'm not on the engineering team. So I, my understanding is that no. It's all but, yeah. user, user driven. Yes. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, so particularly on the Doom side, uh, as a cognitive psychologist, how do you believe that the fight for attention will affect the brains of individuals in society down the line? Oh, goodness. That is a loaded question. <laughs> uh, I can only state my own personal opinion, which is, yeah, I, I am trying not to give my daughter too much screen time, and I would like to use my phone less. <laughs> so you can take what, what you want from that. But I, I do think it's a problem. Um, across society and I, I um, you know, I think we're, social media isn't gonna go away so we have to learn how to deal with it but any way we can turn our phones off in the evening or have um, some even nudges that I think behavioral science could play a part in sort of helping us almost regulate ourselves. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, my question is sort of related to his question. Um, so, you were, you were showing graphs about how there's like all the, you know, maybe like 10 social media esque companies where people sort of go to um, get information about things or see what other people are doing or what other people are buying or what have you. And I know that you did say that um, you look at Pinterest more as a search engine, or that's how the company views itself as more of a visual search engine. Um, but given Given that there are so many users using so few platforms, um, and given that so many people's ideas or so many people's thoughts come from or are stemmed from these very few companies, um, do you like what sort of responsibility do you, as sort of this researcher of this company, you know, influencing these decisions? Um, what what are, what are your viewpoints on sort of? these companies' roles and responsibilities in influencing how society like behaves or how it goes about with its day-to-day -day activities. Like, you know, um, you know, Twitter is a big, so for example, Twitter is like a really big platform for like political discourse, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, they've had a lot of problems with like censorship and whatnot, or at least, you know, supposed problems about censorship and, um, how, how do you, as a researcher at Pinterest, sort of view this and like, how do you influence people's decisions as a society? Well, I mean, I can only speak about Pinner's decisions because we don't have access to other people and, uh, and I can't speak for other companies and, and how they feel, but um, certainly, you know, we believe we're uh, providing a, a service that people opt into, right? People choose to come to our platform and they choose to sign up. So we certainly are not here to influence people's decisions on or off of Pinterest, but we're providing a visual search engine that some people find valuable. Of course, there are billions of ideas that they find on there and we do have teams that take a look and ensure that the content is um, Sort of up to Pinterest standards, if I would say. So, they're they're not going to find, um, you know, stuff you you wouldn't want your uh, child searching for, for example. So we try to take we do take responsibility for what exists on the platform, 
and actively pull things down when they should not be on there. But beyond that, I, I can't say about society at, at large. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to use Pinterest now, possibly, to <laughs> appreciate the, uh, the thoughts. I, I think some of my question mirrors the last one as well as the happy accident. Um, there's a philosophy out there about the daily me, mm -hmm. that we're moving into a, a world where we have capitalized this concept of, I need to curate these news feeds, these tastes, these um, foods, uh, these friends, so that I never encounter a taste or a mm -hmm. idea I don't like. Mm -hmm. And we naturally are inclined to that, and now it's being monetized. It's being forced upon us. So what responsibility uh, do social media uh, platforms as well as search engine platforms have um, to help us get outside of those echo chambers that are, I think, possibly very resultant of this sure. um, movement? Yeah, I think only, only seeing po you know, content that's super relevant to you, of course, would have an influence on, I would assume, narrowing your point of view about a lot of things. Um, so, I'm, you know, taking a perspective of the data and understanding of pinners, I would say our primary purpose is to help people do things offline. Like, that is truly why we don't time spent online. All these things don't really matter that much to us. Um, we are helping people find that recipe or, you know, find that guide that they can then go off and do offline. We actually don't even have a way of tracking, right? Like whether or not they're doing that, but through surveys and trying to under, and asking people, we're trying to understand, are they actively achieving their goals? Um, that's really the mission of Pinterest. We're there just to help people achieve the things they want, you know, find the things they want to do offline. Um, so I can't speak for all of social media. Again, I would like to say, that every company should feel this way. My personal views are, are that they, they should be helping us achieve things um, not just on our phones, and we should be uh, broadening people's viewpoints. And I certainly um, you know, think this is a function of, uh, of us being you know, attached to um, the internet and possibly uh, you know, related to uh, sort of society's polarization even, perhaps. So, um, that's just my own personal viewpoint, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> yeah. Hi. Um, today, many people uh, would love to post uh, their political stance or even a picture that uh, criticizes a specific government policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, many tech, high tech companies like Pinterest or Twitter, Facebook, they would uh, promote other similar contents that agree with the uh, user's political stance. Um, do you think the idea of personalization will polarize the U.S. politics? So we have no political content on Pinterest. So okay. I think it sounds like you're talking more about Facebook or Twitter. Again, I can't speak to those. Unfortunately, I can only tell you my personal views, and okay. that is Thank you. to focus on <laughs> getting offline. <laughs> Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I have a question about the personalization of advertisement. Yeah. Um, Pinterest is a site where people come to actively seek um, objects or things that relate to their interest, whereas other social media sites like Facebook, you really only um, like message a person or look up a person. So for Pinterest, um, personalization of advertisement is almost natural. Mm -hmm. But for other sites where, um, like where the company doesn't have enough data to successfully personalize the advertisement for the user, mm -hmm. um, that would lead to less success on the company's part. So mm -hmm. don't you think, or do you think that personalization of advertisement also pushes companies to um, do, not in Pinterest's case, but mm -hmm. do unethical things that might... Um, like count as information breach, where there are companies that collect information on people through innocent apps and sell them back to the companies that need it? So, I mean, I can only speak as a user myself, right, <laughs> in this case. Um, what I know is that I can go on any site and choose not to see ads or choose not to share information about myself. So I, if, if your views are 
leaning in that direction, I would say you should feel empowered as a user to prevent those types of things from happening. I completely agree that these companies have responsibility to educate everyone about that, um, but there are ways to prevent sharing your information if you think it is serving you ads that are not welcome. Um, could I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. For example, I'm just gonna go with Facebook because that's the one I know the most about. Mm -hmm. So with Facebook, you can choose not to share any personal information and not to show up in Google search. Mm -hmm. But um, on, site, on some sites, even if you don't have a Facebook account, Facebook will track everything you're doing and your cookies and build a user profile for a user that doesn't exist. Yep. Isn't that, since that is completely out of my control, even if I delete my Facebook account, I can't do anything about that? I, I can't speak to whether or not that's even true, so okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, Pinterest doesn't seem to do that, so thank you for answering. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> ah, yes? Kind of going off the last question, um, Privacy is such a big issue with data now. I was wondering what steps Pinterest takes to either protect the data they gain about users or if they sell to third parties at all. Yeah, so um, we have user sort of privacy uh, agreements that everyone signs when they log in to or you know initially create an account. Um, we're adhering to all of GDPR. Um, in addition. Um, I'm sorry, what was the tail end of your question is um, It's kind of a two-part. Do you sell to third parties? Oh, and right. what steps are taken to keep the information that's given to you through users as private? Right, so all of our data is um, aggregated. So we are not looking at an individual user basis. Every IDs are hashed. There's no way to track um, anyone's, um, you know, individual, an individual user back to any particular data point. Um, I don't have knowledge across all of the teams within within Pinterest that use data, so I almost don't want to speak to whether or not we would, I, we don't, it, within my team, within my knowledge, we do not share data with third parties. We use third parties to ask uh, questions about our users, and we can tie that back to our users at an aggregate level. Thank you. Yeah. I'll go. Hey, welcome back to West Lafayette. Um, I was thinking uh, during the presentation about uh, gender. Like, do you have any data on, you know, like yeah. how gender plays a role in the activity of a user or if you have a certain amount mm. of users from one gender versus the other and then if yep. you've done any looks into why that is the case if one gender does prefer over the other one. Yeah, we're about 70, 30 females. It's probably not surprising to most of you. Yeah. Um, but the stereotype is that Pinterest is heavily, heavily female, and we're actually moving towards more, more gender parity there. Um, we're do, we've just started some research on men. Uh, we, don't, we have a bunch of hypotheses as to how they use the platform and why, um, but nothing that I can share at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, it is an area of interest, and... Um, yeah, but not something that we have like specific research on yet. Yeah. Okay, and then um, another thing to talk about is, is there any parts of personality or information that uh, Pinterest gains, um, and this is kind of a twofold question, that they gain that they choose to not share um, with potential um, clients that might be trying to use advertisement? And if, do you think there are certain parts of our personality um, that s social media or companies similar should not give to advertisement companies to use? Yes, I absolutely feel there's information we should not be sharing. Um, the information we share is like the information I've shared with you. Okay. So it is aggregate, high level. Um, you know, we create pitch decks, which our sellers go and used to pitch to potential advertisers to make the case for why they should advertise on Pinterest. Part of that is really just developing our own value proposition and understanding our competitive advantage. I would not want to share user level data, for example, um, but there are certainly lots of 
you know, advertisers are really interested in our data on trends, for example, but, you know, I, the research we've done to date, we haven't found a great methodology yet for truly identifying and capturing sort of emerging trends. So that's just one example where advertisers are asking for something. We don't give up anything unless there's, um, you know, significant research backing it. Thank you. Yeah. And I'd like to thank Naomi Graywall for speaking with us this afternoon. Thank and you. Thank you for questions so graceful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.